found that. But I am going to do that today. And in a moment, I'm simply going to speak on the general topic of a mother's love. I've always liked poetry. My father liked poetry. And therefore, I have quite a few books. And this book that I have right now that I'm going to read from belong to, at least a copy of it, belonged to my grandmother, came to my father. Later on, a sister in Christ, completely coincidental, gave me a copy of the book, and I've had it a long time. It has a collection of poems going back over a multiplicity of years from various poets. And I would like to read this before I get to the actual text and it's entitled nobody knows but mother and you must realize many of these poems are set back in the 19th century and some of the terminology may be somewhat in some cases uh, somewhat different from what we use today I don't think that's so much in this one but to some extent Nobody knows but mother. How many buttons are missing today? Nobody knows but mother. How many playthings are strewn in her way? Nobody knows but mother. How many thimbles and spools has she missed? How many burns on each fat little fist? How many bumps to be cuddled and kissed? Nobody knows but mother. How many hats has she hunted today? Nobody knows but mother. Carelessly hiding themselves in the hay, nobody knows but mother. How many handkerchiefs willfully strayed? How many ribbons for each little maid? How for her care can a mother be paid? Nobody knows but mother. How many muddy shoes all in a row? Nobody knows but mother. How many stockings to darn do you know? Nobody knows but mother. How many little torn aprons to mend? How many hours of toil must she spend? What is the time when her day's work shall end? Nobody knows but mother. How many lunches for Tommy and Sam? Nobody knows but mother. Cookies and apples and blackberry jam. Nobody knows but mother. Nourishing dainties for every sweet tooth. Toddling Dottie and dignified Ruth. How much love sweetens the labor, forsooth. Nobody knows but mother. How many cares does a mother's heart know? Nobody knows but mother. How many joys from her mother love flow? Nobody knows but mother. How many prayers for each little white bed? How many tears for her babes has she shed? How many kisses for each curly head? Nobody knows but mother. My text today on this Mother's Day Above all, on this Lord's Day, but certainly the Bible has so much to say about wives and mothers, is from 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 19. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 19. You'll remember that Hannah did not have any children. She was barren, and she longed for a child. I think it's very difficult in our culture and society to realize what it was for a Jewish mother not to have a child. You can see that when it came to Sarah. You can see it when it comes to Hannah. So she, in praying constantly for a child, promised that she would give God that child if he would bless her with a child. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 19 reads, 
Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Of course, they approached God under the law, and there were those times that they came up to Jerusalem about three times a year, besides other feast days they may have had. But when you look at this particular text, you see a lot of what the author of that poem I just read was trying to say about a mother. Let me parenthetically insert here that with the dilapidation of marriage and especially the home, that there's so many today who don't know what a home ought to be and what a home is. But nevertheless, that doesn't change what God thinks about it. It doesn't change what he revealed in his word. It doesn't change at all what constitutes a scriptural marriage and how a home ought to be run in the roles of parents and children. But in this one little verse, 1 Samuel 3.19, you see a great pattern or example of a good mother. I like to think when I say good in this context, we're, we're seeing how God defines good, and in this particular context, it's more refined because it's dealing with a good mother. And this is a little thing, but she had dedicated Samuel to God. She would not be with him all the time, but since God richly blessed her to have a son, then she dedicated him to God, as I said. And this particular verse shows how much she cared for her son Samuel. Now think how any loving, godly mother a mother under the law of Moses living like it taught them and doing what she did would plan throughout the year to do what she could on that day when she saw her son to show a mother's love. And this the scripture says. You know, we should never, you hear me say this all the time, run over little words, but we should not just run over scriptures like this. God put them there for a purpose. There is a lesson to be learned. And being that these things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4, then we should not ignore such verses as 1 Samuel 2, 19. Samuel was so very young when he started his service to God that an ephod, actually, a vest of sorts, would uh, serve as a coat, cover him entirely. And she made this little coat, this little ephod, this little robe for him to wear. And, of course, she allowed for his growth year by year because she made him one every year. How do I know Hannah loved her only son at that time, at least the first son? Because of what she did for him. You know, we still prove what we say by the things that we bear out in our lives, the fruits that we bear. And we know that mothers love their children because of certain things. And this is just one example. She made him this coat each year to take to him, and they went up to the yearly sacrifice. In Proverbs 13 and verse 24, we have a statement that says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. I know and you know that your mother loved you because she disciplined you. Not only corrective discipline, but preventive discipline and teaching you right from wrong. In Proverbs 29, 15 concerning corrective discipline the rod and rebuke give wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother again the things we bear out in our lives proves what we say Jesus put it this way as far as our relationship to him and our faith in him and our love of him why well, call you me Lord Lord and do not the things which I say so a mother is mindful of the life she lives. She's mindful of what the Bible says about her responsibilities are. 
A mother is not going to allow the ways of the world to influence her attitude toward her husband, for that matter, but especially toward her children. I suggest to you sometimes, if you want to see what a change there has been in general in this nation, is to go back and read a lot of the poetry that was written in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And then ask yourself the question, and I specifically am saying that about the home, about father, and especially about mother. Because when's the last time you read any modern poetry that deals with it like this particular poem did? What is there about the home in America today that would even cause somebody to write that way? Well, you say, don't you think there are any godly homes? Well, certainly I do. But not overall and in general because of the lack of the influence of God's good word over this nation as there was at the time some of these poems were being written. A great many people today have just rejected God or they've rejected the Bible as the word of God and they don't study it intending to abide by the will of heaven on much of anything. They don't spend any time with it. And we have to work on ourselves to make sure we spend the time that his own children ought to spend with it. Studying it, rightly dividing it, meditating on it day and night, laying it up in our heart that we might not sin against God. So the mother practices preventive discipline in teaching the child. But the mother also practices corrective discipline in keeping the child to abide by the way she's taught him to live. And then, of course, the way she lives. We know that a mother cares for her children when they're sick. Now, sickness is a pretty broad term. It can have to do with birth defects. It can have to do with all kinds of ailments of various descriptions. But we live in an age that's much like what Paul said to Timothy, there would be some without natural affection. You remember in Romans 1 with the departure of the Gentiles in general from God when they desired not to retain him in their knowledge, that he gave them over because they were free moral ages to do as they pleased. And, of course, as man usually does, when he does as he pleases without God's influence, he makes the biggest mess out of it possible. And that's exactly what happened overall with the Gentiles engaging in all sorts of immoral, immoral activities to the point where it became a way of life to them. And when you consider the situation with children and their needs, just in day-to-day -day needs, but then especially when they are ill, then how much more so do we need to be mindful of what David said regarding the sick in Psalm 35, verses 13 and 14. He wrote, But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. Now, of course, we must know that when they went into mourning in those days, they were far more demonstrative of doing so than we are, and they would actually put on coarse cloth. I would have called it when I grew up a toe sack, like you'd get feet in. That's basically what they put on. They would sit down and they would cast dirt on their heads as an indicative of the intense misery that they were in. So he says, I did this for the sick. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. What's David saying? Why is that in the Bible? What does God want me to understand about that? That's how much he cared for a person who was sick. And we just simply ask ourselves to be mindful of all of the Bible's teaching regarding loving our neighbors as ourselves, <clears throat> thinking how the Lord asked or answered the question, asked, who is my neighbor? And he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. 
Here is what a mother is. Think of the mother when you think of the Good Samaritan. He has business elsewhere that's important, and he's on a trip. Here are these people's own countrymen who should be the epitome of godliness, a Levite and a priest. They have no time for their own brother who's been beaten, robbed, naked, left for dead. But a Samaritan who the Jews absolutely despised, so much so that they went from Jerusalem and Judea to Galilee, they would cross over to the east of Jordan, go north, and then go back over to Galilee rather than pass through Samaria. Well, think about a mother. If she really cares for her sick children, she would be just like David says he was. She won't leave the side. She will bathe their brow. She'll be there. And she'll be saying little things like, Mama's here. Don't be afraid. There is that natural affection that I mentioned a moment ago that some people don't have. It's natural in the sense that it's a part of us. And yet, there are those, such as those I mentioned in Romans 1, who just give it up by their own will. They give it up. I wish we could all appreciate, I know I do in my own life personally after all these years, to realize the power God has put within me in my free moral agency. I am responsible for my thoughts and my actions and what I don't do. So people can resolve, well, I don't want to believe in God. I don't want to believe in the Bible. I want to come up with something else. And in this life, God will say, have at it. But he'll also think, say things like this, which he said several times in Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That simply means you, you come to a conclusion there's no God. What are you doing about the evidence? How are you honestly hand, handling it? Well, when we look into the revealed mind of God, confessing it to be that, to guide us on this earth, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and we look at the role of fathers and mothers, and today we look at the role of mothers, then some people will say, yes, God is. Christ is the Son of God and the only Savior. And yes, I'm in a scriptural marriage but I don't spend much time looking into the Bible to see what my role as a mother is and to cultivate according to the scriptures that natural desire of a mother to be what she ought to be to her children when you come to the ministry of Jesus there are a number of passages that show that he was extremely benevolent and full of comfort for those who could not help themselves in fact, his whole life was about those who could not help themselves. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So ultimately, what he did was for one reason and one reason only, to save our souls from sin. And think about the mother's role in helping Christ do that as she works with her own family. When you look at Matthew 4, 24, the scripture says of Jesus, Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought him to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics. And he healed them all. We won't go, I urge you to do so, to see the compassion of Jesus. And while I know those miracles were done primarily, first and foremost, to prove he was the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, verse 6, and John 20, 30, and 31, still does not mean as a man like you are and I am that he did not have compassion on people who hurt. And I know of no greater teaching in the Bible of one who exhibits that compassion than a mother for her own children. Thus, when women go contrary to the very feminine 
motherly nature that they have. They have willed to walk away from the greatest role God ever gave to anybody on this earth. It, it should not be a surprise to us that for a multiplicity of years that the devil has worked as hard as he possibly could, and anytime you say that about the devil, that is a lot. That is much, greatly prolonged, intensely he involves himself in it to lessen the importance of Bible teaching on marriage and the home and the roles of father and mother, especially the mother. You know, when the father's doing what the Bible says he is to do, he's outside the home a lot because he knows that unless he provides his own for his own, he's worse than the infidel, so he should be, and the Bible's even, or rather the devil has even moved that talk in the Bible from us because the chief breadwinner you almost get looked upon as some crazy person if you say the husband should be the chief breadwinner. No, not according to modern things. Well, what about the mother? There are many things in the Bible that when a mother employs that the world does not like at all and says she's a doofus, and that's being nice about it, if she does it. But I just don't know of a greater work than a godly mother. You know your uh, mother loves her children when she feeds them and does all that's involved in providing food for them. When she clothes them. And she'll even do it with teenagers when they're not very thankful sometimes and outright rebellious at other times. She'll still be what God says she ought to be to them. She may have to dispense some of these other things I read earlier, such as the matter of corrective discipline, but nevertheless, she's still going to be what the Bible says she ought to be a mother. Now, just read Proverbs chapter 31 and look at what a wife, which of course involves being a mother, does for the good of her home. Listen to Matthew 5, verses 44 through 48. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now why? That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the the just and on the unjust. For if you love those that love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Then he makes a marvelous statement here. He begins it with a therefore, which means in the light of the facts I've just shown you, here's our conclusion. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, God's authored a scheme in the gospel plan of salvation and the scheme of redemption that will allow us to stand before God complete spiritually. Now, come back to a mother and their work in the home. Tell me if she is not the one primarily that she is not the one to teach those children these things. This doesn't rule out the father. But you see, these things can begin very, very early in the child's life. And who but the mother should be doing that? Look at the love of Christ as set forth in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, Adventure for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Now I want you to think about that disposition of heart manifested in one's life, the fruits born out in one's life, the actions of one when it comes to a mother and her role when it comes to running the house and taking care of the children. A mother lives a righteous life, a godly life, before those children. Including praying for them, teaching them the Bible. But above all, she lives what she teaches. She doesn't teach something and then live contrary to it. She knows God's Word because you can't teach what you don't know. Nobody can. In 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, Paul says this, I thank God. Then he said, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, speaking to Timothy, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in you also. As the church is primarily and fundamentally a teaching institution, it's quite obvious then that Timothy's mother and grandmother realize that if he were to be what he ought to be, they had to, in practice and in teaching, deliver to him the oracles of God. And what an example to all of us. The psalmist in Psalm 22 and verse 10 said, I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. That aptly fits in as a divine commentary from the Old Testament on what Timothy or what Paul was saying to Timothy about his grandmother and his mother and their influence on him in teaching him the Word of God. There is no substitute for teaching people the Word of God. My grandmother used to say, well, you need to work with them from the time to get their eyes open. Somebody else said one time, I remember a preacher in fact, he grew up with my mother. Someone, he said, asked him one time, when, when do you start getting your children's attention? Which I thought, even as a young person, not married, I thought that's kind of a ridiculous question. But his answer was, well, as soon as they're able to get your attention. How early is that? <laughs> I've told this before, but it fits pretty well here. Because, you know, being the, being the first child of, I've often thought maybe this is the reason that under the Old Testament he, he got the birthright because of what he had to deal with <laughs> and the blunders of his parents trying to take care of them. And I remember when Timothy was born, brought him home from the hospital and put him in our apartment and put him in his bed. And I didn't have... Uh, a wife who didn't know anything about babies because we've talked many a time with her having taken one of her younger sisters and virtually started raising it because she's the oldest of seven. I suppose that was her birthright to get the chance to help raise some of the younger ones. But that's in the days of diapers and folding diapers. Whoo, and the diaper pail. But what I'm saying here is you put Timothy, and we didn't think anything about it, one way or the other in his bed and leave the light on so you can look in the room to see him. But then you decide to turn the light off. And you realize how a few days old baby has a very strong will, if you haven't already realized it. And he likes things just like we do that are comfortable to him. And he liked the light being on, and he didn't like it being turned off. <laughs> and you know, he wasn't very nice about it. He wanted to make racket till he got his light turned back on. How soon do you get their attention? Just as soon as they can get yours, and they can do that rather quickly. So we need to be mindful that mothers will understand those things sometimes quicker than fathers. It's also important as we bring the lesson down to a close to realize that mothers have 
carried their infant, felt its first kick, all the way up through the whole gestation period until birth is ready to take place. And then they had to go through the process of birth. I heard it said from several people that doctors have told some men that the only way uh, you can understand uh, maybe what childbirth is like is for you to pass a kidney stone. Well, that might be. The point is, it makes the point. And the point is, the mother undergoes a whole lot before the baby ever gets in this world. But you know, you can biologically bear a child, and that's all a part of being a mother. But the greatest part of being a mother is after the child's born. Then the rearing and the nurturing and the teaching and the example and the understanding and the patience and the long suffering that is exemplary of what the Bible teaches a mother is comes forth now I don't know about all fathers but my view was that when the children little showed out and they, they should be immediately reprimanded and you know better than that sit down and be quiet if you will watch mothers they'll get the same thing done but they'll simply do something like cause its tension to be turned away from whatever's got agitated right now when the father might say, shut up or I'm going to box your ears. There was a reason God made a woman. And many times we men read all that in Genesis, and that's great, not enough read it, not enough understand it, about the creation of man and the creation of woman. And we don't realize that when he created woman, that he created a potential mother. So there has to be all of those particular natural ingredients that fit one not only being a wife, but being a mother. Men just can't be mothers. They never were meant to be mothers anymore than they were meant to be wives, and I don't care what is said in this country. It it just throws me for a loop even now when some woman says, well, my wife said so-and-so, or some man says, my husband said thus-and-so. That's contrary to nature, contrary to all that's good, and no man was ever meant to be a mother, and no woman was ever meant to be a father. Never. I don't care who throws me in the deepest jail or whatever. It doesn't change God. It doesn't change his will. It doesn't change our responsibility to him. And all things will be vindicated on the day of judgment. And I know who's going to hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joy of thy Lord. It'll be those people who humble themselves before God and accepted his way of salvation and obedience to the gospel, God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16, and being a believer in Christ, repenting of his sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, and being added to the church, they live their lives like the Bible teaches godly people do. And that involves being the mother that we talked about this morning. I'm sure that you could add a whole lot more to what I've said, but I've tried to just sort of construct a little bit, if nothing else, to remind us about what it is to be a mother, and it all begins with your attitude toward God, your creator. Same thing's true of man, being a husband, and being a father. So if we're not willing to follow God's direction and teaching as our creator, and what he meant for us to do on this earth, then it's no wonder people are in the mess they're in because I don't see any other purpose, design of life, other than to fear God and keep his commandments, which is the whole duty of man. Now, make that general statement apply to marriage of the home, to the roles of husbands and wives, fathers, and today, mothers. So study your Bible. Know God's word. 
in every phase of it. As a child of God, if you've sinned, there's a second law of pardon. You must repent of those sins. Come confessing them. We'll all pray with you and for you that your sins be forgiven. So I hope this lesson has helped us all be more mindful of the importance of marriage in the home, and especially mothers, on this day in this country, but on every day as long as we live. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.